Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the speakers so far today. I got to confess, the next speaker actually intimidates me a little bit. Uh, Tom Capper intimidates me mostly because he's smarter than I am. Uh, and he has very strong opinions about SEO, but he's very fun to argue with. Uh, Tom previously worked uh, for years running the uh, consulting arm of Distilled in London. Uh, now he heads up search science teams at Moz doing research and working with Moz's uh, next generation of tools. Today he's talking about core web vitals. If there has been a topic that has dominated SEO for the past year, it has been core web vitals. But the problem with that conversation, it's been lacking a lot of actionable insights. Tom, so Tom's been diving into this to figure out what we should actually do with Core Web Vitals uh, to see measurable results. His talk is titled, The Fast and the Spurious Core Web Vitals in SEO. Please welcome the smartest guy in the room, Mr. Tom Capper. At this point, you may be thinking that you've heard everything that there is to be said about Core Web Vitals. Uh, this tweet is from my colleague Cyrus, and this was way back in February, uh, months ago at this point. Uh, it's, it's now been over a year since we first heard about this update from Google and since we've known that it was coming and what it was going to be about. And yeah, uh, as he says, I'm physically unable to tweet one more word about these damn Core Web Vitals. Uh, I don't want to lose you straight away, though. Uh, I'm going to try and give you a slightly different perspective. What if I told you that Core Web Vitals and this update are a bluff? Google is bluffing. However, your business is at stake here, or maybe your boss or your client's business is at stake here, so you can't exactly afford to call the bluff but you can sort of cheat. Is that more interesting? This is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the flaws of Core Web Vitals, then why they're taking such a ridiculous amount of time to roll out still, and then does it matter and what to do next? So firstly, the flaws. You've probably seen this graphic by now. This is from Google's original announcement, uh, or well, from one of their 2020 announcements. Uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about each of these three new metrics uh, and why I think individually and taken together, they actually have some uh, rather large holes in them. So firstly, uh, largest contentful paint. So this is the one that's kind of closest to a traditional site speed metric, right? This is how long it takes the largest element on the page to load. So if I take a page like this, what's the largest element is the first question we're going to ask, right? Because that's what it's going to judge. It's going to be how long it takes the largest element on this page to load. So what is the largest element? Well, intuitively, we might think it could be one of these two uh, hero images. Or maybe one of these chunky text blocks. Now, if the text loads quicker than the images, we might be kind of incentivized to make the text larger, right? Because we would want the quicker element to be identified as the largest element. And that's kind of perverse incentive. That's probably not improving the page really, but it would improve this metric. As it happens, there are a lot of tools out there that will tell you uh, which the largest element on the page is according to this method, You know, which, met which element you're going to be judged on by this metric. Uh, MozPro is one of those tools, and it turns out that it's this block at the top. This is the element that your large contentful page will be judged on if you are the Moz block. Not that intuitive, right? What about this e-commerce page? I think probably I would guess it was this. This is, a, I think, an AMD advert, uh, but it's actually this. It's the, the cookie overlay is what Google will judge your largest contentful paint on for this page. And is it fair to compare either of those with a page like this? So on this page, the, the, uh, the diagram is kind of the very important key element of this page. And if the diagram is not there, then the page is kind of worthless. It's completely dominated. Now, the largest item on the Moz blog homepage was not that important to the page. But the largest element here is. So is that 
fair, really, to compare the two using the same method? What about first input delay? So this is how long it takes from the user's first click, which is at their discretion, on an interactive element, to when the processing happens uh, for that click. So it's not how long it takes for the page to actually update or the browser to update in response to that processing, it's how long it takes for the processing itself. And this only counts uh, click events on interactive elements. So it does not account for scrolls or zooms or that kind of thing. So again, if I wanted to optimize the MozBlog homepage for first input delay, I've got some kind of weird incentives going on. Th those two big hero images that I highlighted before, those are both links at the moment. They're links to the blog posts. And obviously the user is quite likely to try and click on them. So if I made those not links, then when the user clicked, uh, nothing would happen. So the clock wouldn't start for measuring first input delay because the user hasn't yet clicked on something. They've, you know, they've clicked on something that wasn't a link. So as far as first input delay is concerned, they haven't clicked. So removing these links from these images would probably improve my first input delay metric. Again, rather at the expense of user experience. Similarly, I could make the, the titles of the blog posts absolutely tiny so that in order to click on them, my users have to sort of brush off their Call of Duty skills uh, and get that precise click. And again, that's going to be pretty bad for user experience, but it should improve this metric because by the time the user has managed to click on these obscure elements, the page is going to have finished loading, so they're going to get a much more reactive experience, sort of. Or maybe I could put this big call to action at the top, which actually isn't a link, but looks like one, again, to base out their click and buy time while we're waiting for the page to finish loading. All great ways to improve your first input delay by ruining your user experience. What about cumulative layout shift? Uh, this is your uh, maximum change to the layout of the page within a five second session window, or so it's called. Uh, this is session not in the same sense that it's used in any other Google technology. Confusingly, it's a completely different meaning of the word. Um, but it's the maximum change in this five second duration. So if you have an annoying pop up maybe to collect your user's email addresses or something like that, then you definitely want to make sure that that's you know, 20 seconds after page load when they're halfway through the article, because that's not annoying at all, right? But it would improve this metric. Now, clearly, I'm being silly. You shouldn't do any of these terrible optimizations that I've just suggested to you. But my point is, uh, doesn't this all feel a little bit unwieldy? To compare two pages based on these kinds of factors, it's inevitably a bit of an apple to oranges comparison. And that's not even getting to the data issue. What if you know, all, all of this data that Google is going to use to judge you on for these metrics is based on real users using Chrome in what's called the uh, Crux database? So what if the page that you are trying to rank with doesn't have enough traffic yet to be in that database? Uh, what if your whole site doesn't have enough traffic to be in that database? Uh, Google have said that they'll try and aggregate based on similar pages, so presumably they'll judge a new page based on pages on the same template on your site. But what if your new page is on a new template? Or what if it's a new website altogether? Or what if you just don't get much traffic in general right now? Maybe that's why you're trying to do SEO in the first place, right? Maybe you're just not eligible for the boost in that case. Seems harsh. So hold all of those flaws, all of those problems in the back of your head for a moment because now we're going to talk about a very related topic, which is why this is all taking so long to actually roll out. So I'm going to take you back to the original announcement, May 2020, Google said, this update is coming and it will be in 2021. Fine, okay. Then in November they said, well, actually it won't be until May, okay. And then a month before that new deadline, they said, oh, well, hold up, we're not ready. It will be at least June. I mean, fair enough. I guess we've all been there. But uh, it didn't stop there. In May, uh, they started backtracking what they said in the first place. In May 2021, this is the second May, they started backtracking. Because in the original announcement, they said, uh, if a page hits the recommended targets for all three metrics, 
So if you meet a certain threshold that they've set for performance, all of these metrics, then you would pass the assessment and you would get a boost. And they sort of said that twice on the same page. So this wasn't a typo or an accident or something. But then in May 2021, uh, they said something slightly different. They said it is not the case that unless you reach the good threshold for all of the Core Web Vitals metrics, that you have to reach the threshold to get a ranking boost. And when they issued this clarification, they said something like, oh, we've noticed some confusion. Well, yeah, you will notice some confusion if you directly contradict yourself. It's not, it's not too surprising, is it? But then in the same statement, they said, uh, in fact, it's kind of the opposite. You'll get a ranking boost for reaching the good threshold for all pages, uh, presumably for all metrics. But these are not kind of the opposite. They're the same. Uh, so you've, yeah, issued a statement that contradicts your previous statement. And then in the same statement, you've contradicted the new one. Great. OK. Crystal clear. And then about the same time, uh, now we're going to get a ranking boost if we just improve our speed but don't hit the threshold, presumably separate to the other ranking boost you just said we'd get if we did hit the threshold. Great, OK. I'm not going to try and pull these apart and you know do the, uh, do the, um, the chronology to figure out exactly what's meant by all of this. But my point is just to ask the question, why is there the need to constantly clarify, update, amend, delay? Why have they not made their minds up and decided how this is going to work and told us, if, given that that seems to be what they're trying to do? To, to answer that question, I'm going to take you on a brief tangent into a thought experiment you may have heard of, which is called the prisoner's dilemma. So this is a, a situation, a hypothetical situation, where there's two partners in crime who are in a prison cell together. And they're going to be taken out of the cell one at a time to be interviewed in private. Now, if they both confess in their separate private interviews, then obviously they'll both be found guilty, but they'll both get somewhat lenient sentences because they both confessed. On the other hand, if only one of them confesses, or well, the one that confessed obviously incriminated the other one and was cooperative, so they'll get an extra lenient sentence. In fact, they'll pretty much get away scot-free. But then the one that didn't confess, well, they were found guilty and they didn't confess, so they can get a very harsh sentence. And obviously, similarly, if it's mirrored, the sentences will be mirrored. But then the, in the scenario where both of them remain silent, well, they can't be convicted at all. Now, the, uh, the system is still a bit suspicious of them at this point, so they both do remain in prison, but only for very minimal sentences. So if you're one of these prisoners and you don't know what the other prisoner is going to do, you can't collaborate, what are your incentives? This is kind of the, the bottom right cell here. This is the optimal outcome, right? Uh, for, for the group as a whole on aggregate. But the trouble is both prisoners face the risk of the other confessing and obviously they want zero years for themselves. So if I am one of these prisoners and I stay quiet, the potential outcomes are I either get one year or 20 years. But if I confess, my potential outcomes are either zero years or five, which is better in either case. So I'm going to confess, right? But the other prisoner is facing the same situation, so they're going to confess as well. So we end up here. We're in this cell in the, in the top left, which is worse in every sense than the outcome in the bottom right. And it's kind of inevitable. And the idea is that this game is impossible to win. They cannot trust each other or cooperate when only one of them is in the room. So they always lose the game and the system always wins. This is kind of like what's taking place with Core Web Vitals. We all know now, we have done for some time, that when Google announces ranking factors like these, it's because they want to use SEOs as a lever to change the shape of the web. So we've seen it quite a few times, you know, with uh, HTTPS, with mobile friendliness. But ultimately, it's a bluff. Google cannot roll out changes that reduce the quality of their search results. That would undermine them totally, right? So they're relying on all of us SEOs actually being manipulated and cooperating at the same time because we've been incentivized to do so. We are the prisoners here. If, if my competitor even might improve their site, then I have to improve mine as well. Even though if both of us did nothing, rankings would be the same 
as if both of us invested that effort, that cost. We ultimately can't guarantee that our fellow SEOs will not improve their sites. That's the theory that Google is going on. So they have made it extra hard for themselves. Uh, remember that Web Vitals, as opposed to Core Web Vitals, is actually seven metrics, four of which were already ranking factors. So if we understand Google correctly, perhaps, in some of those earlier statements, depending how you read them, you would actually have to pass all seven metrics for a boost. And it's possible that a lot of sites were already getting boosts for some of them, but now wouldn't because they didn't do the top ones. So Google is in a situation where they could degrade their results. Basically, Google has said, if most of you SEOs can improve your websites, you'll do better than those who don't. And they're hoping that as a result, we will all confess, we will all improve our websites, we'll all end up in the top left. But as a collective, SEOs have somehow done the impossible and won the prisoner's dilemma. You know, through our uh, combination, perhaps, of ineptitude or maybe laziness or probably a lack of executive buy-in, we've won the prisoner's dilemma. We've ended up in the bottom right. So I, I want to back up this claim with a bit of data. So uh, I took a look at, uh, at the Moscast corpus. So Moscast, if you're not familiar with it, this is a, a corpus of 10,000 keywords where basically Moz reports on algorithm fluctuations and features coming and going based on 10,000 reasonably competitive keywords that are regularly recrawled. I decided to take all the URLs ranking top 20 for a keyword in the Moscast dataset and see what was up. Now, it turned out that only 30% of them actually had crux data, which is surprisingly low when you consider, like I said, that these are ranking top 20 for fairly competitive terms. And then of those 30%, I was curious, how many had actually passed? How many were eligible for a ranking boost? Initially, I was quite impressed. 53%-ish uh, met the threshold for cumulative layout shift. 48% did for largest contentful paint. 88% met the threshold for first input delay. I'll probably publish more of this data over time with benchmarks and updates and ranking correlations and so on, so, so look out for that. But in, in this case, I was mostly interested in how many were meeting all of these thresholds. And it turned out, that although 64%-ish were meeting two out of three, less than 30% were meeting all three. So now we're in a situation where 30% of URLs have the crux data available at all, and then of that 30%, only 30% actually pass and are eligible for the boost. That's pretty tricky for Google. And we've seen this before. Remember how mobile Geddon seemed a bit of a non-event? With so few URLs passing for the, to be eligible for the boost this time, we might end up looking back on this similarly. Uh, or maybe it'll be like Medic, where they roll it out it seems to make their results worse, perhaps, because two months later, they pretty much roll it back to how it was before. And Google have alluded to this too. They have suggested, uh, oh, it's going to be a tiebreaker. They sort of try to downplay it. Although, like my former colleague, uh, Will Critchlow, I sort of don't buy that. Um, I think in a system as complex as Google's ranking algorithm, you can't really ever have a tie. So if, if they're literally true and it's a tiebreaker, I think it will do nothing. Uh, but either way, they're trying to downplay this. So having said all of that, having sort of uh, downplayed and uh, criticized everything about the whole system and suggested it's flawed and silly and a bluff, um, am I suggesting you just shouldn't care? Well, maybe not quite. When I was looking at that MozCast data, I also looked at the impact on ranking, although Maybe that's a bad way of putting it, because I actually looked at the average difference in rank, and you should judge for yourself whether that's an impact. Because URLs which passed, you know, that small quantity of URLs that passed the assessment based on their crux data, they ranked on average 2.3 places higher than those that didn't. That's kind of, you know, if you, if you do pay attention to ranking factor studies, you should, you should be careful here, because this is kind of flawed, right? Because in order to get this data in the first place, in order to pass based on crux data, you have to have crux data, which means you have to have traffic, which means you probably already rank highly. Indeed, URLs that had crux data at all, regardless of how well they performed, 
were already ranking 2.8 positions higher uh, on average than URLs that didn't, which is kind of inevitable, right? That's how they got the data in the first place. But when I looked at the second one, when I looked at URLs that passed the crux assessment controlling for the availability of data, there was still a positive impact. They still ranked on average 0.4 positions higher. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but if I said to you, oh, you can rank you know, half a position higher for all of your keywords, I think you'd bite my hand off. And incidentally, that's a larger impact than being in the top 50% of pages by speed. And it's also a larger impact than a lot of link-based factors. Even considering all of that, if we zoom out a little bit and look at mobile Geddon, like I said before, sure, it wasn't a big thing at the time, but would you really launch a, you know, a few years later in 2021, would you really launch a desktop only website or even an MDOT site? It's got to be, be ready. It's got to be better to be ready for the future, right? On top of that, there are plenty of other reasons to uh, worry about speed. There have been numerous correlations over the years at this point uh, showing that, or numerous studies, I should say, showing that there's a correlation between pages being very fast and them um, converting well. And then there's a reason that you probably weren't thinking about, which is Google Discover. So this is the personalized article suggestions you see when you open the Google app or the, uh, or the new tab screen in Chrome on mobile. It's a huge traffic opportunity that SEOs are sleeping on. Uh, at the moment, basically every site I've seen that's taking Discover even remotely seriously is getting more Discover traffic than they are organic. And it's also incredibly responsive to site speed to such an extent that I've often seen it written or I've seen SEOs advising that uh, Discover is AMP only. It's not AMP only at all. It's just that if you're not a, a massive household brand national publisher, you probably need to have AMP levels of site speed to compete here. This is an example of what I'm talking about. This is, a, this is traffic from late last year from a site with a domain authority of around 30 that was getting hardly any organic traffic. This is a stacked chart. So you can see that tiny purple sliver. The thickness of that is the amount of organic traffic they were getting, which is virtually none. But they were getting hundreds of thousands of discover hits per day. And this is what happened to them in the December 3rd algorithm update. And then that recovery afterwards, that you can see at the end of the graph, that was then when we started to fix some of their site speed issues. So to reiterate, Discover is a massive opportunity, but it's incredibly and increasingly responsive to site speed. And this is the future. So that borne in mind, what should we do next? Well, we just spent a good chunk of time unpicking what on earth Google is doing, and I'm going to try and unpick that into a few lessons and a few actions. So what have we learned? Firstly, we're going to want to prioritize our high traffic pages, as cynical as it seems. That is the game we're playing now. Secondly, some of these metrics are not the most robust, uh, but we should not try to fix them at the expense of overall speed and experience. So how are we going to go about those one by one? Prioritize high traffic pages. I, I think it's worth briefly covering here a key distinction, which is between field and lab data. So field data in this case means data collected in the field or data collected in, uh, in Chrome from real users. And that's what Google is using. Lab data, on the other hand, is synthetic data that you might collect externally. It's more scientific, but it may not be as representative. So you know, the field data is more representative. Uh, it's exactly what Google is using, but it sometimes makes unfair comparisons based on you know, arbitrary user devices and so on. And the lab data is viable for staging sites, new pages, et cetera, et cetera, which uh, field data obviously isn't. And then you can, if you use a Google methodology for your lab data, it starts to look like the more useful of the two. Um, so for my personal site, for example, the field data doesn't exist, but I can still look at lab data. Then if I look at a site like moz.com, which has a mix of high traffic and newer pages, uh, I can still use lab data. So this screenshot is from Moz Pro, and you can see I'm prioritizing by traffic level and comparing higher and lower traffic pages side by side. I can then look at aggregate scores within you know, maybe a template or certain groupings that might contain high and low traffic pages together. So, okay, then we need to optimize the metrics, right? 
So there's some less obvious uh, methods that are open to you. For cumulative layout shift, uh, like we said, this is the maximum change in a five second window. So this is a um, this is a screenshot from Reddit while it's loading. And you can see that even though the content at the top isn't there, they've got blocks that hold the place. So when the content does load, it doesn't rearrange the page at all. You can also move unstable elements beneath the fold. So uh, this is an example from The Guardian. Don't worry about the tiny text. I just want you to track the layout as this loads. So you can see this, uh, this tweet comes into view. And then there's this advert as well that rearranges the text yet again. But all of this is beneath the fold. So the cumulative layout shift metric for this page is 0.05, which is well beneath the threshold. This would pass that test, despite all of this movement. You could also, in an extreme case, actually delay the render until the elements were ready altogether, but I wouldn't really recommend that. Then there's largest contentful paint. So obviously, like we talked about at the start, the first thing you're going to need to do is identify which element is actually uh, the largest. Again, this is a Moz Pro screenshot, but there are ways you can do this. Uh, if you were having uh, hero images, you know, if, imagine if the Moz blog had a big hero image at the top that was the largest element, and that was uh, slow to load. If you were on the fence previously about whether to have a hero image, this might push you over the edge on that, right? And then, of course, similar to what we were talking about before, you could drop larger elements uh, beneath the fold so they don't affect this. And then the last metric is uh, first input delay. This is the weirdest one, really, because this is about humans, right? Uh, this is about when the human decides they need to click. So on a page like this that we looked at earlier, uh, a human kind of needs to click immediately to view the page. So it's going to end up with a delay because they're clicking while the page is still loading. Obviously, I'm just scratching the surface here with what you can do with some of these metrics. Uh, you can make a heavy presentation about just that. Uh, but sometimes it's difficult to know where to start. And I think it's worth trying to uh, identify the metrics you need to fix and then tracking your, or then matching your fixes and your opportunities onto the metrics you're targeting. So we tried to do this a little bit in Moz Pro again and sort of uh, let you know that you know, if layout shift is your weak point, you can prioritize the issues that are likely to impact that. Uh, but we'll also show you which elements uh, are actually causing those issues. Uh, however, with all of this, uh, like I said before, we can't be doing it at the expense of more holistic or user experience focused improvements. Uh, Google have actually said that over time they plan to incorporate more and more uh, metrics and signals each year. Uh, so I think you need to make sure you have a holistic approach here. You need to make sure that you're not just gaming the few metrics that are currently included and that you're, you're tracking absolute speed alongside these new metrics. That's what we're doing uh, and that's what we recommend you do as well. Thank you and that's all from me.